everybody. This is the Coffee with the Geek program. It is July of 2023, full summer swing here. And I have a, a special guest as always. And this is a maybe a two or three time guest on the, the show. I think you might be. Uh, I think it's number three. Yeah, yeah. So I think you might be the first third time guest. So Wow, very special. I know. I know. Well, my guest probably doesn't need any uh, introduction in the ed tech world, but I'll give uh, an introduction anyways. This is Mary Howard, a good friend and colleague, and Mary is a national board certified sixth grade ELA and science teacher from Grand Island, New York. Yes, that island that looks like a pork chop. Yes, <laughs> you fill that one in. Uh, <laughs> so, yep, Grand Island, New York, and Mary has spent over 10 years, we'll put it that way, uh, presenting at dozens of technology conferences across the straight, across New York State, and uh, even has become globally recognized. And your topics of conversation often, you're so innovative, Mary, it's hard to like pin it down to even this small number here, but you do a lot with augmented reality and virtual reality. You really run the gamut in so many ways, uh, teaching, and you can find like your success stories in uh, your blog, yoursmarticles.com, an excellent read for those teachers out there of any content and subject area. And you have published numerous educational articles, one that we co-authored uh, together that was an awesome one on virtual reality, but you've uh, have a variety of uh, presentations on virtual environments, virtual reality, 3D design, QR codes, engagement strategies. I've seen pretty much many of your, your presentations. Um, you have won numerous uh, accolades, and that would be 2018's International Society, ESD's uh, Tech Education's Virtual Pioneer of the Year Award and Silver Presidential Volunteer Service Award. You are New York State Teacher of the Year finalist in 2018 and 2020, and is a New York State Master Teacher. You have just recently, and this is what we're going to hopefully talk a lot about today, is authored a book called Artificial Intelligence to Streamline Your Teacher Life. Uh, read it, got my copy here. Yay. Oh, you can't see it. Right, yeah, there, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Pull it in front of the filter. And Outside of that, personally, you have uh, three boys that you have spent your time raising and now are turning into men, right? Oh, yeah. Boys to men. And uh, you are refereeing youth hockey as well as playing hockey. You're still, you're still playing, right? Yep, absolutely. All right. And uh, you also are an avid runner. Adirondack 46er, I think that was a secret code for something. Yeah, the and high you've, peaks. Yes. Nice. And you recently cycled across New York State on the Erie Canal. And to find Mary, you can go to Twitter, Mrs. Howard 118, Instagram using your smarticles underscore between using and your, and Mary Howard 118 on TikTok. And of course, just go to yoursmarticles.com and you'll find all the information you got on it. connecting. So Mary, welcome. Whew, that was a lot. That's a know, long list. Thank you. I know. Well, it wasn't <laughs> even half of it, right? So I guess let's start with the best question. What is your favorite cup of coffee these days? What are you drinking? Um, well, my favorite cup of coffee is a warm cup of coffee. Um, right now, <laughs> I am doing the Tim Hortons Large Double Double. Mm. This, this tends to be the go-to because Tim Hortons is like half a mile from my house on the pork chop. Yes. Nice. I um, Let's see if you can see this. So I got this uh, a couple of years ago from my wife and it's, uh, you know, so L.L. Bean peanuts and take a hike isn't that nice I, I do i do have a favorite coffee mug i wish i had brought it upstairs it has a picture of the forest on it and it says may the forest be with you <laughs> so that is my favorite coffee mug i, I use that most of the time yes I, we should have mentioned you are the queen anything. of puns can we, can we say you're the queen of puns you, you go right ahead anything okay. pun related that is my jam <laughs> absolutely <laughs> All right. It's not my jelly. It's my jam. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's dig in. We've got a lot to talk about. Uh, so 
tell us, I guess, maybe for those of you who are, are coming across your work for the first time, tell us kind of your ed- educational journey. It's, this is one of my favorite questions to start people off because I find it fascinating how people got into teaching and how, how teaching has inspired them and taken off. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and your educational journey to where you are now? Sure. I was actually um, kind of a late life teacher. I uh, had a different career for about 12 years working in marketing and public relations at independent health. So that was my first career. Had my children and um, there was always that creative side of me tugging at me and decided that it was time to pursue education. So back to school, I went to, at Niagara University to get my master's degree and then uh, ended up teaching sixth grade on Grand Island. And that's really pretty much where I've been almost my entire career, sixth grade. And I love it. So you've been an, as I mentioned, an innovative uh, educator. I think you, I think your curiosity is what always has um, fascinated me and I think inspired me in a lot of ways. And you never seem to stop kind of being curious and trying new things. So can you tell maybe a little bit about some of the projects you've worked on in the past and maybe what were some of the the best success stories that you had? So many and so many of them involve you. You know, you've you've been as much of a muse to me, I think, as as I have to you, perhaps, you know, our, our collaborations have have spawned some incredible things ahead of our time type of things, you know, and I think uh, I used to teach social studies for quite some time and you being quite a history buff, um, you know, that was a really nice, um, and a a tech buff, that was a good combination. So some of the initiatives that we did using virtual environments back when virtual reality wasn't even being talked to, talked about on the ed tech scene, um, you know, they're just real moments, you know, stellar moments in in my path and in my journey, thinking about um, the work that we did with the Darwin Martin House and Frank Lloyd Wright and bringing kids into a virtual environment and teaching them about the art and the architecture that is is the you know Darwin Martin House and Frank Lloyd Frank Lloyd Wright um, architecture and seeing the passion that they had to you know design and build in these virtual spaces it was kind of like Minecraft on steroids and really Minecraft before Minecraft took off in the education realm we were doing that first and you know some really amazing work came out of that i didn't even mention my youtube channel but you know some of that work is featured on my youtube channel and i'm sure it's mentioned on yours as well and and it was just seeing the passion that technology brings to the classroom and and more importantly how it ignites some of those you know recalcitrant kids the kids that you just just you, that can't sit and get right that can't you know that school really isn't designed for them and seeing what technology did and does for those students that was probably the best part of it all yeah i think one of the moments i'll remember most when i when i call it a career one day is the time that i went into grand island and worked with you and your kids on the air of the king project uh, and seeing you know the magic that really happened and, and the enthusiasm level of the kids. But more important than that, it was the conversations that I was hearing the kids having. First of all, the kids were helping the other kids with the technology. So that I think was a surprise, a welcome surprise for both of us is that the kids really were the tech support. They yeah. were built in and they learned so fast and they were totally willing to help each other with, with the technology. But also just the content that they were talking about, you know, I, I think both of us kind of worried going in like, okay, this is kind of a game. Like, are they just going to think of it as a game? Are they going to think of it as learning? We want them, we want it to be both. And, but the weren't, the learning was the key piece, but the conversations from the students and the learning that you saw on the other end was incredible. And I think made us both believers in the power of technology. Yeah. And just to give a little background in the year of the King project, that was also a virtual environment project. And that was a, that was a space where we brought the students into once again, uh, you know, this virtual world we, we titled Stormville <laughs> and, and the, the students all had avatars and these avatars would walk around and they would explore this virtual world that we pretty much we designed. And along the way, they had to sort of uncover this mystery and who is the rightful heir to the throne. And as they tried to uncover this mystery, they were learning about everything, 
every target that I needed them to learn when it came to the Middle Ages, and then some, because they were also doing, you know, argumentative writing, and they were doing investigation and exploration. So, um, you know, all of that wrapped up into some really high end tech, which was kind of scary. You know, it was, it was, will they get it? Will they shut down, you know, and the reverse happened. You know, they dove in and, like you said, helped each other and helped us in a way. You know, when we were getting stuck, they're like, hey, wait, I found the shortcut or, hey, look at this. And, you know, just such amazing stuff. You know, I was the last uh, Coffee the Geek interview was with uh, Margie Wright and Nick Varnoli, and they have a website about um, using your failure as a superpower. We had a lot of bumps in the road with that project in particular. And I know it's it's really, it happens in technology a lot. You're gonna run into those unforeseen circumstances and obstacles, whether it's filters in school, whether it's the technology just doesn't work. The internet goes down that day. Um, can you talk a little bit maybe about like the failures and how they've really maybe kind of honed, honed your game a little bit? Um, you know, two of my, when I think about like my educational philosophy, I always say, you know, I, I need students to tolerate ambiguity and they need to build, re, you know, resilience and technology does that in spades, right? When you're, you know, encountering this technology hurdle um, or for educators that aren't really comfortable with technology, you know, that's, that's the key is to, to, to embrace you know, the, the, the gray, because there's going to be a lot of areas that are just like, I'm not totally clear on how this is going to work, or I'm not totally clear on if it's going to work, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is often the case, right? <laughs> and then, you know, just to be able to you know, pivot if you need to pivot or reach out to the kids and have them help you along the way. So, you know, modeling perseverance as an educator is the best thing you can do for other, other educators as well as for the kids. I don't know everything. You know, if we don't know everything, well, let's figure it out. You know, there's there's always a way. So I think it's just kind of a good life lesson. Yeah, I I, I agree. And I, I really like your take on, you know, one of the things we really have to teach kids in this era is battling through pitfalls, obstacles. I, I guess we should always have done that, but particularly with uh, technology. And life. Yes. <laughs> there's there's no challenges in life what are you talking about <laughs> i i live in second life <laughs> uh, real life doesn't exist anyways um so let's dig into the new book this is really fascinating i'm i'm so proud of you for for putting this yeah. out there and really jumping ahead of of the curve on ai and let me ask you this question, and I'm going to kind of throw you a little bit of a curveball because it That's wasn't okay. part of the question set that I had, but, and, and maybe it was, but are you seeing in your experience talking and working with others? And I know you went to the ISTE conference, and I'm sure there was probably a lot of like really positive buzz about it there, but outside of those circles, the really high ed tech folks, are you seeing educators jumping in, being very wary? What are your kind of, what's your it's, sense at this point? It's a great question. And, and it was something I grappled with when I was writing the book, because, you know, the way I'm looking at it right now is there are definitely two sides to this. Uh, you know, when I discovered ChatGPT, I was looking at it through the lens of how can it help me? And I wrote that book, How Can It Help Teachers? Where at the same time, you know, if you got that other, other realm, okay, the kids are going to get a hold of this. And how is this going to impact us in the classroom from that perspective? And what can we do? You know, so I think you have both. I think you have the sky is falling. You know, people are like, oh, no, this is going to be, you know, a disaster in my classroom. You know, they're going to cheat their pants off because you give kids a shortcut. They're taking it. You know, that's that's human nature. Mm -hmm. You know, but on the second side, um, I really believe that this is going to lift the load you know it's going to streamline teachers lives i think it's got tremendous potential to just keep us in the profession too many people are leaving teaching teaching is hard you know and i i really feel that this is going to give you that little step stool give teachers that step stool that they might need so i think the answer has two sides 
you know, and at the conference, there were, were a lot of people, you know, hey, look at this, look at this, this is great, this is great. You know, we're all drinking from the same Kool-Aid at ISTE, right? We all really believe in the power of technology and what it can do for education. On the other side, there's definitely that fear, that reluctance, let's block it, let's block it. Um, and I really feel that we need to be responsible with it. I don't think, um, I think we need to kind of change what we're doing with instruction to allow the space for it because, you know, everybody's saying it. There was the calculator and then there was Google and the information's always been available. Encyclopedias have always been there. We just had to teach students how to be responsible with it and how to use it effectively. In some ways, we just have to change the way we're teaching. We can't, they can Google any answer, right? We have to change. We have to be more reflective, more Socratic, and and you know have students be engaging in more conversation rather than just looking up information. It's a long answer. I'm not sure that's yeah. true. Like, it's a long no, answer, but. no, it absolutely <clears throat> was. Can you tell me about the the kind of publishing process and writing process that you went to? That's always fascinating. And did you think? You're an avid blogger who posts a lot of great ideas and tips on your blog. Why go the book route? And maybe talk about that. And, and by the way, I reading the book, what I love about the book is it is kind of, you know, you, you don't think of books as being kind of hands on, right? Um, but this, you gave a lot of practical strategies that you kind of are almost like walking you through how to use chat GPT, which I, which I really liked. And it really helped me learn the process because that even for me, you know, wrapping my head around AI and what exactly is chat GPT and what is it going to do you walking through it with the book and actually saying, Hey, you know, type in this question and, and see what happens. Um, I think that it was almost kind of like hand holding in a, in a, in a way, which Good. doesn't often happen with books. So uh, I'm assuming that was kind of your intention with that chapter of, of letting people kind of walk through it with you. Um, can you talk about just, you know, why a book, what was the process of the book, all that fun stuff that, that went into that? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I really wanted it to be, you know, the, the guide for educators. I, I, I did actually struggle with the title. That was not my original title, Artificial Intelligence to Streamline Your Teacher Life, but it was kind of the ultimate goal. I think, uh, not quite sure how to answer this question. There's a lot to it. The The journey of publishing a book is very scary. It, for, for me, it was really scary along the way. It was a bucket list. I've always thought I need to write an ed tech book and I wanted to write augmented reality. I wanted to write one in virtual reality. And, you know, Jamie Donnelly, if you're not familiar with Jamie Donnelly, she's incredible, you know, and she kind of took on this moniker of, of being the queen of AR and VR. And I was like, I don't know if I can, I can do what she had done, but I'd always wanted to do something. And then I discovered chat GPT and right around Christmas time and started playing with it. And I was like, this is it. You know, that when that image hits you and that vision hits you, I just knew, you know, the vision hit me. And I'm like, this is the book. This is the book that's going to help teachers and allow me to publish and all of it. And so it was a, a very scary but exciting time. Definitely scary. <laughs> Can you tell me about, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by just your publishers and that sort of thing. How did you get it started? Who was there or somebody you reached out to that said, hey, I want to do a book? And like the people behind the scenes, because I know there's, you know, a team behind the scenes of for creating a book. Yeah, it was um, I, I wrote first and worried about getting it published later. So I sat down and said, I'm writing a book. So I wrote um, the outline, the table of contents, about five chapters. And I was like, OK, I think I have something now. And it was then that I started to reach out to publishers. So um, I reached out to uh, six or seven different publishers with the um, with the outline. And, and most publishers have kind of like a form you have to fill out. So it wasn't it wasn't uh, propose first and then write. It was actually write half of it and then propose it. Um, and I definitely want to give a shout out to my publishing group. Um, you know, it was X Factor EDU published the book. They're a collaboration with Codebreakers and Mammoth EDU. And um, I met with them online. I pitched my, you know, idea, sent them the draft that I had so far. And they, right off the bat, it was just a perfect fit. They were like so excited to see a book on this topic. It, it aligned with their vision. And they were incredible to work with. And we... 
they saw the same thing that I saw that we want to get this depressed fast because it's a hot topic and they dropped everything. Um, Matthew Joseph, awesome, awesome, awesome guy dropped everything and we ground it out and it was the fastest turnaround they've ever had too. We managed to get it out within less than three months, but that was because most of it had already been written too. Right. Well, it was pretty amazing because I remember like I just started hearing about it and it's like, Mary's got a book on it. <laughs> like, how did that happen? Like, a it was lot just of kind of nights. circling down into, you know, education circles. So the timing was, was perfect. And that hopefully that hard work of pushing forward with it quickly uh, paid off. And I, the reason I kind of ask you about the process of writing a book and what you do, I, I found and I'm sure you found this too, that you've come across so many like amazing veteran teachers, amazing veteran teachers. And I, I, it makes me kind of sad when they retire and they walk out of the building and I'm like, wow, like some incredible knowledge just walked out the door. Yeah. And I'd like to bottle that. <laughs> I'd like I to know. capture some of that and see it. And that's, and that's what I love about the fact that you put this to a book, I was kind of uh, leading that, but you really are an inspiration and an innovator in education, a true professional, someone who never stops learning. You, you, I, I've called you the, the curriculum whisperer. You, you, you <laughs> like just something new comes along, like I'll write a curriculum about it. <laughs> yeah, bam, you know, and it's, it, it really is. It's a, you're a true professional in that. And I believe you have so much to share, uh, not just as a model, but, you know, the knowledge that you've put in. And that's why I like this book, because it does, it showcases you. It showcases kind of your thought process and how you kind of pursue a new technology is what I like about it. Because, you know, like I said, like you're like ahead of the game on so many things because you're, you're constantly learning, checking things out going on social media, finding the new thing, and then actually tweaking it and finding out how it works and getting under the hood and that sort of thing. So some of it's tinkering. Like I like to, I like the engineering side That's of tinkering. perfect word for it. Yeah, yeah. I like, I like to tinker. So you see a new toy, you start to tinker with it, you play with it and you're like, you know, does, okay, how does this work? How does that work? How can I apply it here? You know, it's, it's more than tinkering. It's because it's like, okay, I need to find the application. And that's where the book came in. It almost helped me learn about the tool because the more I played, the more I discovered. And so then I just started documenting what I was doing. You know, I was like, that's a cool tool. You know, it's writing paragraphs. I wonder if you can write me a paragraph on a science topic. And I wonder if you can write the paragraph on the science topic and then give me some questions related to that. And it just kept going and going. And, and so that's kind of how the book ended up, you know, forming. Now, it's not evident in the book, but what I did is I kind of, I don't know if you're familiar with Harvey Silver and the Thoughtful Classroom. Um, he's, uh, you know, wonder, wonderful um, professional development provider, but also has this great vision for how the classroom is laid out with these four cornerstones. And so the book is actually organized by the four cornerstones of the Thoughtful Classroom. And so these four components that come into play um, when you're when you're dealing with any classroom. So you've got like organization. And so you you if you read, you saw there's a whole like chapter on how ChatGPT can support organization in your classroom and then engagement, which has always been my thing, right? I need to, I need mm. to get those little weirdos, <laughs> sixth grade weirdos <laughs> now, and you know, ways that it can support engagement. And you've got classroom rules and structure and procedure. So that's set up like that. And then of course that culture of thinking and learning and how it can support you. So it was sort of loosely set up based on that framework. Oh, okay. So I had a lot of interesting. You, you got me off track of my next Sorry. question. So let me come back to it. <laughs> yeah. um, so your book is dedicated to your husband and you also talk about the influence of your mom and dad. And, um, you know, you, I think you said something about your mom just keeps on, keeps going all the time. Oh, she <laughs> or, is uh, an energizer buddy. Yes, she is. You want to talk just a little bit about the people that have inspired like you as a teacher and, and your work in this book? Well, you you know, you're, you're definitely in the mix. I think, I think we think about all of the people along our journey, you know, that were thought leaders and, and inspiring people, um, always going, always creating, always moving and, and pursuing, you know, the, the next shiny thing, right? So um, I, I refer to sort of like that whole conglomeration of, of 
ed tech innovators out there that have been on this journey as well. You know, we've all, we have, we're both big fans of NiceGate and, and we've been uh -huh. at this conference for nearly 20 years, um, you know, sharing with a, a great group of educators um, that are passionate about what technology can do for education. So that was a big part of it. You know, another big part of it is my colleagues at school, you know, they, they, they let me be this, the, the, cat lady in the back corner the weirdo in the back corner of the, the <laughs> school doing the well there she goes again she's doing this she's doing that <laughs> you know not knowing along the way a lot of it wasn't working because that's you know as we said that's the reality of it you know you get this yeah. great idea and then you bring it in and it's like oh that was a disaster you know and then of course mom and dad you know and my husband they were all part of that, you know, that you have to have a, a rock behind you. And that it kind of is my, my husband, you know, he read through that book so many times, you know, he lent this, he's an engineer and he lent this critical eye to it. And, you know, if I went on a tangent or if I was too whimsical, he'd bring me back, you know, and, and, and you might want to say this, you got off the rails a little bit, Mary. stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, I, I credit my father too, as well as mom, because dad, you know, he's, he's 82 years old. He's the most technology astute 82 year old I've ever met. And he sits on his phone every morning and he finds articles on chat GBT and fires them off. Just literally loads up my email, but it kept me so on top of the game and everything that was happening with chat GPT. He was the one that told me about GPT four when it came out, you know, so these, these people in your life are, are so important. You know, we talk about, operating in silos, right? We can't do it. We have, we are a collaborative group, so nothing happens solo. Excellent points. So um, what I did was I went on chat GPT and I said, uh, what are some questions to ask a teacher using chat GPT? Here we go. <laughs> it gave me, it gave me 15, <laughs> just 15, Thanks. you know, Thanks, all in a matter of 20 seconds. So I, I won't ask all 15, but I kind of highlighted some that I thought were good. And I know you could kind of dig deeper into. So okay. one of them is what are the potential benefits of integrating AI into the education system? And what are some of the potential challenges? Oh, I think we kind of covered it. Mm -hmm. You know, the benefits, of course, it's going to lift the load for educators if they're willing to give it a try and adopt it. That's definitely a benefit. Another benefit um, is going to be the, it. We need to change our pedagogy as a result of this tool. We, we have to. And it's something that's been needing to change all along, you know, so maybe it'll be the catalyst for that change. Um, I think obviously the pitfalls are going to be very obvious. Um, I, I have you seen the debate between uh, Socrates and Bill Gates? It's um, an AI generated YouTube video. Got to look it up. Um, and it's this debate between Socrates and Bill Gates. And so, um, so, of course, Bill Gates says that AI is going to be this magnifying glass. You know, it helps us see more clearly and helps us make more informed decisions. Um, and support discourse and conversation. Socrates, on the other hand, is like, mm, is AI going to make us complacent? You know, he, he references a tree, you know, and in order for a tree to grow strong, the winds must, you know, buff it against it so that it can grow strong roots. You know, we need a little bit of adversity. We can't have everything be so easy. And so there's that, you know, Socrates side of things. Is, is this going to not help us? You know, is this a pitfall? Are students not going to grow those strong roots that they need in order to be more successful? So I think it's kind of, it sort of summarizes the question that you just asked, the positives and the negatives. So it's kind of a balance. We yeah. Have, we have to keep that balance in mind. So with if, within that, so are there any ethical considerations or concerns associated with the use of AI in education and how are these things being addressed or how can they be addressed? Yeah, they definitely need to be addressed. I, you know, I was just looking at some literature this morning and it seems like the, the line is very gray in terms of copyright when it comes to AI. It's too new. Um, and people haven't quite, you know, decided. Uh, I saw an article that talked about Japan just uh, deemed AI content not to be copyright protected. And, you know, so that's a concern. You know, you, you can generate text and claim it as your own. And, you know, it makes you question, you know, ethically, is it, it wasn't your work, you know, so we, we can't claim this work. So I, I think that's... Uh, it's still developing. I think it hasn't, uh, you know, I know where I stand on it. You know, I use it as a three-legged stool. 
Um, it's going to turn things back to you that are incorrect and erroneous. It's a language learning model. You know, it's just predicting the next word in sequence. Uh, so you have to be careful. Okay, let me uh, dig into one of the other questions here. And actually, I didn't have it highlighted, but I think it's a good one. How can AI be used to personalize and enhance the learning experience for students with diverse needs and learning styles? I do like... I do have a section in the back of the book that's that lists out all the things that we can do for you know our challenged learners and there's so many things it can do to support that and the more tools that we have to support our challenged learners the better you know so examples of rewriting passages at lower reading levels or you know altering um, question sets to change the phrasing the wording eliminate answer choices things like that are extremely helpful repeat the question for me again though because I had one more idea on that Sure. So as how can AI be used to personalize and enhance the learning experience for students with diverse needs and learning styles? So I think also, um, you know, we talk about generative AI. So right, that everything we've been seeing has been categorized into this concept of generative, you know, AI generates things. But I feel as though AI can be used in an evaluative nature. I mean, it's not the whole purpose of the model, but student work, you know, let's say students type something and they put it into the bot and they ask it to change it or to review it or to, I think that's going untapped. I think that's a new component of AI that we need to consider, you know, so like my students are going to write me some passages in the fall and I'm going to have them put those passages into the bot and ask it to, you know, um, evaluate it for them. And so I think that can support students as well. And I don't think lots of people are going there yet. They're just looking at it from the other direction. Yeah, I love that idea, actually. Yeah, yeah and I hadn't even put that into consideration yet. So that, that's a really good one. And another idea I just had yesterday, you know, I, I had um, ChatGPT generate acrostic poems for every single one of my students using their name. So like Andy, you know, A would of course be awesome and would be <laughs> nice. D would be determined and Y would be yes, man. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so whatever Did you say N was nerd? I want nerd. I, I know there's no E, there's no E in your name. Or G, for, or, uh, but anyway, um, so I was thinking having ChatGPT generate these these acrostic poems for the students' names without knowing the students, and then giving each student the acrostic poem that it came up with for them, and then having them argue it, like look at it and say, oh, no, 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 you know, now I'm not a yes man, I'm more, you know, yearning for exploration, you know, so I think it'd be a really neat way to have students interact with the bot, but also be extremely reflective. So I was kind of excited about that idea. I thought it might be great for the fall. Okay, so You've just come from, from ISTE, so this might be the perfect question to ask. So what are some examples of successful AI applications in education that you have seen or implemented personally? Well, the one Success I just read, stories. Yeah, right. the one I just mentioned, I think is pretty cool. Even at the end of the year, just generating those acrostic poems for the kids and putting them on bookmarks so they had a little take home, you know. So it's always the things that are going to give you that lift. People are raving about Curapod and what it can do. There's several of these slide generators, um, you know, that generate, it's not just ChatGPT, but that generate this content for teachers, you know, that when they're in a pinch or, you know, when they don't have a starting point. And I think those are definitely success stories. I'm a big fan of the app smashing that I've been doing with ChatGPT. Um, you know, I've been able to smash it with crossword puzzle makers, word search makers, GimKit Kahoot, Cram Quizlets, quizzes, um, and all of those kind of sites where you can generate the content and then you pop them on over into a site. So I really like app smashing. I feel like that's a really great use of the tool. Are there examples of kind of critical thinking, pushing students critical thinking? Yes, I think what I mentioned before in terms of putting their work into the bot, you know, putting their work in and having it analyze their work and have giving them a moment to be reflective on the changes that, you know, the, the bot has suggested. I, I think that really supports critical thinking or, you know, having them analyze a human written passage and one written and seeing if they can, you know, pick out mistakes that might've happened or identifying bias. I mean, this is one of the things that there, there's a real risk when it comes to using, there's implicit bias. You know, the, the model was trained by humans. That human bias is 
is inherent in the training, you know, and, and having conversations about that and can, especially with history, I think, you know, if, if it's writing a passage related to history, can students evaluate those passages and find any bias that might be, you know, in there? I think it's a higher order skill more for secondary, but I think it's a really neat use of the tool. Yeah, and I think that illustrates, again, the, the potential danger in, in the fact that if they put a historical event and they mischaracterize it or, you know, um, yeah. it, it's up to the student and the teacher to make sure that they're uh, evaluating and using other sources and that sort of thing. So yeah, lots of questions to kind of keep going with this, but um, let me just maybe come back to the ISTE thing, because um, was there anything at ISTE as far as AI that really like, wham, wow, this is cool. This is where I see this going. And I guess maybe that tailors into kind of what's next for you. What are you seeing? Again, you always seem to be kind of looking at the next trend and ideas. Yeah, I I have, um, most of it was just the, the excitement over this concept of artificial intelligence. And a little part of me was, uh, was not like artificial intelligence is be the term is being used too loosely. You know, the, the real concept of artificial intelligence is a sentient, uh, a sentient being, you know, and we are still working with algorithms, you know, and, and artificial intelligence, the way people are all talking about it right now, they've adopted it as a buzzword. Um, and a lot of it, it's algor it's still algorithms. You, ha you haven't had true artificial intelligence happen yet, you know. Um, ChatGPT4 is a really great podcast. Sorry, besides yours. <laughs> There's a, This American Life had a That's really- a good one. Yeah, like that. Had a really great podcast recently talking about ChatGPT4 and the and the fact that it actually is showing reasoning skills and reasoning power. And so that got me kind of excited because that's the true nature of artificial intelligence. And I think right now what we are seeing is what we saw way back when Web 2.0 tools came out. I think it was 2005. <laughs> we're seeing this explosion, you know, like in in new tools and and they're wonderful and they're great. But the skeptic in me is like, you know, it's really not true artificial intelligence it's it's just more bots that are more powerful that that are running algorithms but it's still all good stuff again that's not what you asked me but you know yeah. I, I like tossing that out there because you know i i think about what's next for me i think i'm kind of headed toward looking more at the at the ethical side of things and how to support teachers in ethical use both in and outside the classroom and um more of the other tools that people are exploring. You know, it is exciting. There are hundreds of new tools, just like back with the web 2.0 tools, like the hundreds. So I really want to start playing with those. I've sort of compartmentalized myself into chat GPT, but there's so many more. Um, and and they're, it's time to explore them and see what else is out there. So before we go to with the speaky questions, is there a possibility for a follow-up book? Are you... I don't, is that I, in your mind yet or I, I I have thought about it you know I was like okay this one is talking to the teacher and how they can improve their life I think maybe it's time to talk to the teacher and how they can use AI to support classwork like students use of AI so it's been marinating marinating <laughs> see what I did there <laughs> <laughs> it's been marionating up there that, that that might be a book I don't know yet Okay. Yeah. Well, stay tuned for that then. All right. It is time for some speed geek questions. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, and... yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's been fast and furious social networks. So what's your favorite? TikTok. Okay. How come? Um, because it's, uh, I love being a content creator on TikTok. And you get a lot of exposure, you get a lot of feedback, a lot of views, and you feel like you're improving your reach and your range. It used to be Twitter, but a TikTok, I'm starting to turn towards TikTok. What is your, are you a gamer at all? And what's your game? Not really a gamer. No, I just not. Not even words with friends, angry birds, anything like that? No, no, I'll do, I'm a puzzle person. I love puzzles, you know, and I'll play world from time to time, but really not. So, okay. 
that's a fair answer. Yeah. Uh, favorite educational blog outside of your own, of course. Oh, um, I really like Cult of Pedagogy. Jennifer Can't Gonzalez. Go yeah. Phenomenal. Amazing. Yeah. Yep. It's a one-stop shop. It really is. And uh, what's your favorite way to unplug? Um, I usually grab the plug and I carefully <laughs> and just pull on it to make sure you never That's grab the cord. Never grab the cord. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I, I like to kayak. Um, I live on a island surrounded by water, you know, and I can get out of the classroom and be on that water within a half an hour and it all drifts, drifts, literally mm. dr drifts away, you know, and I, I love looking at the, the nature and drifting along. And I was out on my paddleboard in the middle of the river yesterday and I thought, this is it. Like, ooh, this is what it's all about. It's fantastic. There is a magic to water, I think. Yeah. It really clears your mind. So, yes. all right. Well, Mary Howard, the Andy Wheelock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking forward to seeing all of the magic that happens beyond this. And thank you for joining me and enjoy your summer. And we'll see you at NiceGate, of course. Absolutely. In November. Thank you.